So welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you had a good coffee break and were able to get some refreshments and get uh, yourself caffeinated. Uh, one thing that I have to mention is the fact that the doors on the building lock. And if you go outside, you're not going to be able to get back in unless someone helps you in. We'll have people looking after the doors to sort of keep track of that. But if you go out at some time during the session and there's no one there, you can either um, call me or um, Monica Morrison, whose uh, numbers are on the door, and we can come and get you if you find yourself locked out. Um, we're also going to uh, be going to lunch, and so we will help people go through the logistics of lunch after the second. Uh, we've got two atmospheric lectures coming up. Uh, we have a short break between them. Uh, the first lecture is going to be uh, Peter Loretzen. Um, we might get the slides and things worked out so we can get, oh, we already have that, fantastic. So um, Peter's an atmospheric dynamicist and very important in terms of how we build the underlying elements of our atmospheric model. And I will hand over to Peter. Thank you. You all caffeinated? Remember to drink more water than coffee, okay? It's high up here, it's dry, it's hot. Alrighty, so I have the pleasure to spend the next 45 minutes uh, with you talking about the atmospheric component of the CESM. The atmospheric component is called the community atmosphere model. And again, there's a big emphasis on community here. We built this model with the community uh, we're here for you to help run the model. You can do research with us, etc. If you guys want to come visit us, uh, NCAR has various programs for, for graduate students uh, or postdocs to come and visit us and sometimes also bring your advisor with you. So if you want to explore that, um, look that up. Before I start, um, how many of you here think of yourself as like doing more atmosphere than the other components? Oh, a lot of you. Okay, how about uh, ocean? Got any oceanographers here? Good. And then what about land and ice? No ice be. Oh, there's one. Good. <laughs> Great. So my intention with this lecture is um, to kind of reach all of you. So I want the people here who um, uh, have had less experience with atmospheric modeling. I want you to walk away with an idea of what goes into building this model. And then for you, for those of you who are in atmospheric modeling, I have some juicy stuff for you as well. So here's the outline um, of my of my talk. So I'm gonna give an introduction, um, so just to discretization grids, which leads me to defining resolved and unresolved scales, kind of a gray area where we don't have a good mathematical handle of what's going on. And then just a brief introduction to you know, the, the nature of atmospheric dynamics and the nonlinearities non of it. And then I'll define you know, the dynamical core, which is loosely speaking, you know, the fluid flow solver in, in our system. And then you know, everything else, which we put into parameterization. So I'm gonna loosely define those two terms. After that, I'm gonna dive into our current um, or I should say past workhorse dynamical core, the finite volume dynamical core, that's the one you're gonna be using in the practical sessions. So I'm gonna go into some details there. Um, and throughout the presentation, I'm also gonna talk about what I would call the next generation dynamical cores that we have in the system. And we're trying to switch over to them because the finite volume dynamical core is roughly 20 years old. So it's, getting out of date, but it has served us very well for many years. Also throughout the talk, I'm gonna show some of the commands, like some of the technical things um, on, on how to set up the model and so on. So you have some kind of idea with respect to that. And of course the, uh, the focus is gonna be on, on the die core. I'm not gonna talk about the other aspects. I, re I usually like to walk around I feel like I'm like a column just standing here. It's very formal, but anyway. Uh, so the domain we're modeling, we're in global modeling here mostly. So here, here's a satellite image of, uh, of Earth. Uh, we do not know how to solve the equations of motions analytically unless we vastly simplify it. So our best tool uh, is to discretize our, our system and solve it on a computer. So the first step in discretizing 
in terms of global modeling is we need a global grid. So here I'm just showing a regular lat long grid overlay overlaid this um, satellite image. As soon as you define a grid, as we've done here, then we define our prognostic variables in there. So in, in, for the atmosphere, it will be pressure, wind components, temperature, um, water vapor, whatever traces we have in there. And we, we define them as grid cell average values. So as soon as you define a grid, you define the smallest scale, you can explicitly resolve on the grid. So we typically run you know, 100 by 100 kilometer grid cell model. So this, these cells here, think of them as about 100 kilometers. That means that the smallest scale you can, you can uh, in terms of wave, you can represent like the two delta X wave. You need two grid cells for that. The smallest scale would be 200 kilometers. However, I'd like to point you uh, or draw your attention to the fact that even though we can represent a 200 kilometer wave on this grid, we may not represent it accurately. So for those of you who have taken classes in numerical methods, you've probably done a von Neumann stability analysis where you linearize the system and then you look at how different waves are damped or dispersed. In other words, not represented accurately. Uh, but we can also look at this in full models. And we do that by looking at the total kinetic energy spectra. So we, we plot how much energy, I don't know if I can point here. Yeah, we compute how much energy on the y-axis here there is at each wavelength. So I've used a wave number here, K is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So that means you have the two delta X wave would be up here and then longer waves out there. And what we observe in nature for large scale dynamics is that, that um, we get a, a straight line with a, a slope of minus three on a log log scale. So that's this straight line up here. That's observations. But what we observe in our model is that, that Typically, you know, our energy gets reduced uh, when we go to smaller, smaller scales. And the energy here, I'm look, we usually look at is just the kinetic energy somewhere in the troposphere. So one can then define, say, okay, we're not representing these scales in terms of having enough energy at these scales. So we can define the point at which we at which we depart from this straight line. So it will be right around here. We can define that as our effect resolution so we know when we go beyond that resolution we don't have as much energy as in observation and that typically happens you know at the four to ten well ten is pretty bad but typically at the four to six delta x wavelength um so that's 400 kilometers five 500 kilometers so that's a lot longer than the 100 kilometer scale so i just want you guys to be aware of that if you look at extremes in the model that typically happen at the grid scale you should probably also thinking think about this. Um, the counter argument for this is the parameterizations actually work at the grid scale. But from a dynamicist point of view, we don't really trust the, the smaller scales of the model. Alrighty, so we have a resolved scale that I've just defined in terms of the grid. Um, everything, anything that goes on below that grid scale, we have to parameterize in some way. Um, and Rich Neal, who, who's going to talk next, he's going to focus on that aspect uh, of the problem. All right, in order to build a credible uh, atmospheric model, we need to represent you know, the phenomena in the system that, we, that are important to have there in order to do credible weather climate simulations. And I'd like to show this figure here by Professor John Fuburn, who has a space time diagram of different important phenomena in the atmosphere. So on the x-axis here, you have time scales from you know, less than a second all the way up to the seasonal time scale. And on the y-axis here, you have from millimeters all the way to the planetary um, scales. So I'm just going to walk down this uh, dashed line here. You know, on the larger scales, we have you know circulations uh, uh, associated with the Asian summer monsoon there on the seasonal time scale and the planetary time uh, space scale. So that's planetary means it's the sizes of the size of the Earth. So it's uh, about ten to the fourth kilometers. And we walk down here. We have 
uh, undulations in the jet stream. I don't know if you guys have looked at weather maps and looked at jet stream, you see the wavelengths are like comparable to the, the, the size of the US. These, these are really big, big waves in the system. Next on the list, you have regular cyclones and anti-cyclones with, with um, time scales of several weeks, thousands of kilometers in, uh, in size. And then on next going down this list, we have you know, transition zones between warm and hot air that, that collapse. Um, and they are about 10 kilometers or so, days and time scales. And then we have the, the big elephant in the room, and that is convection. Convection can be organized in a huge uh, range of both space and, and time scales. Um, so you have the you know, big interstitial oscillations in, in, in the tropics, uh, down to the supercells, down to individual squall lines. You know, they all go in sizes from thousands of kilometers all the way down to, to a few kilometers. And then on the smaller scales, you have these small cumulo um, clouds that form from the turbulent eddy is in the boundary of the lift the air high enough up that you have con condensation occurring. So this is, a, this is why I call this a big elephant in the room because that's where we have a lot of trouble in our model to uh, models in, to represent this. And then let's not forget about the smaller scale, all the, the, the turbulent eddies in, in, in the boundary layer all the way down to the scales where molecular diffusion becomes significant. So that's down at the millimeter scale. So it's kind of just to give an idea of, of the different phenomena we need to represent in one way um, or another. And one thing that's very important to notice here that everything happens on this continuum of scales. There's no clear scale separation in this system here, which makes it very, very challenging to model. There are also some other curves on this plot here. Those are gravity waves and internal uh, acoustic waves. In gravity waves, there can be several sources. They can come from uh, the orography. They can be triggered by uh, convection. There's a lot of release of latent energy that sets up these, these gravity waves that propagate really fast. Um, some equations of motion also to, uh, support uh, acoustic waves or sound waves. And these waves here uh, are not energetically that significant. The reason why I mentioned them to you is from a numerical methods point of view, um, these can limit the maximum time step we can take in the model uh, to make sure it doesn't blow up. So even though we might not care about acoustic waves, they're not really that important. They, they, they're kind of a headache when you do uh, numerical discretizations. So if I mark here the resolutions that uh, global models are typically run at, so the, the gray area here, it will be like the one kilometer scale, oh, sorry, one degree scale, 100 kilometer scale. Um, in, in space and time, it's about 30 minutes. If I put the highest resolution we typically run at, so Gokhan talked about the IHAS project that will be run at 25 kilometers. Um, you see that as we increase the resolution, we can start explicitly resolve more and more phenomena. Um, kind of the big thing that's going on in the global modeling community is now that we can get down to roughly Three kilometer resolution, we can actually explicitly resolve some of the deeper um, convection. So, if you're interested in that, you know, look up these diamond simulations that is taking up a lot of attention in, in our community. Alrighty, in terms of uh, model code, we, we um, artificially or somewhat artificially separate things into two modules. So. We have the dynamical core that, uh, roughly speaking, solves the uh, equations of motion associated with thermodynamics and on resolved scales. And then everything else is taken care of by the parameterization. So that will be you know, radiation, turbulence, et cetera, everything we can't do in the dynamical core. The two need to be coupled somehow. Um, there are several approaches here. Uh, one is called process split. So that means that each of the parameterizations, the gravity waves, convection, and so on, they all give in the same result scale um, state of the atmosphere. And then they compute their tendencies based on that. The other approach is called time split. This was used in the finite volume core that you guys are be, gonna be using. 
And that's where each permutation updates the state. And then that updated state is given to the next permutation. So that means that the order at which you run the permutation actually matters. This topic here didn't use to get a lot of attention um, in our community, but it's there's some renewed at, uh, interest in it. So there's a conference series called Physics Dynamics Coupling that focus on, on these kinds of issues. And it's it's my favorite conference every 18 months. It's a pretty small nerdy community, but, but it's taking on some, some pretty interesting problems in, in global modeling. All righty. That was kind of the introduction here. Um, let's dive into, in particular, the finite volume dynamical core here. So as I've talked about, we, we need a horizontal grid. Um, finite volume dynamical core uses a lat regular latitude longitude grid, which is shown on the, on the figure here. And here's the command we use to, to uh, set up the model to run with that grid. So this res dash res option here, you set it to F09. F09 MG17, then you, the atmosphere will run on this one uh, degree grid. We also have other dynamical cores. I'm just quickly gonna, sh gonna um, show you how you could specify the grids for those. So one of our newer dynamical cores that I'll talk about more a little bit later is called the spectral element dynamical core with a variant called uh, SEC SLAM that uses a, a um, a different transport scheme than, than spectral elements. And again, it's set up with these commands here. And the, we're not, uh, the way we specify resolution, uh, it's kind of relates to how the discretization grid is, is defined. So here, NE30 would refer to how many elements do you have along a cube sphere site? And for a one degree spectral element model, that's 30. Um, this other option here, you see on the right, that's what we're currently targeting at our next one degree uh, application. So therefore I'm just have one slide just showing you how that grid looks like because it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so for various reasons here, um, we chose uh, to, to build a variant where the tracers are vectored on this grid here inside each element. This is this discretization grid native to the spectral element method. And then physics can be run on the same grid as the tracers or on a coarser uh, or finer grid. So the cutting edge development of our model right now uses this combination where you have a three by three grid for tracers and physics. So they're all one, one degree. We also have um, a newer dynamical core in here. It's called model for prediction across scales. It's defined on this Voronoi tessellation of the spheres shown down here. Here, the resolution is specified in terms of kilometers. So it's about 120 kilometer resolution mesh. I'll provide some more details about that die core later. And then we also have uh, the FV3 dynamical core in here. It's loosely speaking, a cube sphere version of the finite volume dynamical core. That's what the National Weather Service is used for its global weather forecast. So we have a version of that within CESM. So just like to point out here that having uh, these dynamical cores in the same framework inside of CESM makes CESM uh, quite unique compared to other uh, modeling system. So that mean, it basically means that you can seamlessly switch between dynamical cores in this system. So you can use that to do, in my opinion, a lot of interesting science. You can study your simulation sensitivity to die core using exactly the same physics package. Um, if you're into simpler model research that Gokhan men mentioned and that I will talk more about, you can easily run it with the different dynamical cores and do comparisons. In the past, grad students and postdocs would spend months hacking the code to do these kinds of things. That's become very easy to do. Um, there's also a lot of uh, performance comparison happening in, in, the, in the community. And when I mean performance is computational performance. And again, you can do an apples to apples comparison here, running everything within CESM. It's hard to compare computational performance across modeling systems and on different platforms. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, this facilitates or enables numerical methods research if you're interested in that. And we've actually one example where we ported numerical methods from one die core to, to the other. 
Okay, there was a lot of talk about horizontal grids. Let's go to the vertical grid. So all our dike, dike cores except for MPAS use a pressure-based terrain following uh, vertical coordinate that's shown on, on the figure here. So that means we define our vertical levels in terms of these hybrid coefficient, the A's and B's here. Then we have a P0 here, which is constant. And then the surface pressure here. So near the surface, the B here is one, A is zero. So that means our lowest layer here will just follow surface pressure, meaning it will just follow whatever the orography looks like. And as, as we go higher up in the atmosphere, the Bs get smaller and smaller towards zero, and then A become A move towards one, so you have pressure levels um, aloft. The MPAS dynamical core uses terrain following coordinates too, but it's a Z-based vertical coordinate, not a pressure-based. All of the die cores, uh, except for uh, MPAS, again, uh, uses a floating Lagrangian vertical coordinate. So that means that the vertical coordinate are material surfaces. So if you think of two coordinate surfaces sitting like this, and you have convergence of air coming in, these are material surfaces, they will just expand. If you have divergence, they will contract, as shown on the figure right here. So you see they start deforming. Uh, the advantage of doing this is that you only need 2D numerical methods because the vertical coordinate just moves up and down according to the flow. There's no flow across the boundaries. So you only need 2D methods. That's what makes this very attractive. But the problem is with Lagrangian methods, um, if you run long enough, these surfaces get really, really deformed. Um, so every so often we map back to our reference surfaces. And, the finite volume uh, dynamical core that's, if I remember correctly, it's every 15 minutes and a one degree setup. In terms of vertical levels, uh, we've kind of been a little behind the curves. We only had 26 levels in our CAM4 configuration, uh, CAM5, 32, and CAM6, or I think it was only 30 in CAM5 and CAM6, which is the latest generation, we have 32 levels. Um, and the latest cutting edge model we're working on right now um, has about 80 or 90 levels and then a much higher lid um, than we currently have. Again, you can change this um, with, with these, these commands. We'll learn more about it later. Just a little warning, if you do change either horizontal or the vertical resolution, you need to provide a new initial condition file and our physics package is very sensitive, especially to vertical resolution. So you might have to retune the model, which is a non-trivial exercise. Um, but functionally, everything is there for you if you want to change these things. In terms of the vertical extent of the model, uh, we have quite a few configurations here. So we have the regular low top model, um, used for most applications that has a 42 kilometer top. Again, that's the cutting edge. We're moving it up to 80 kilometers, similar to what's used at IFS at ESNWF. Then we have a model called Wacom, WAC, uh, whole atmosphere model, where we have a well resolved stratosphere where the top is about 140 kilometers. Um, then we also do geospace modeling where the top is all the way up at 600 kilometers. Alrighty, the story so far, I've talked about defining uh, grid scale and subgrid scale resolved in Henry-Skull's waves. We've looked at the um, of the space-time overview of different phenomena in the atmosphere as important. I've defined horizontal and vertical grids for you. Now it's time to um, look at the dynamical core in terms of equations and it's helpful to take a step back and, and, and look at like what equations are we using? What is the thermodynamics we're using? And what approximations and assumptions are we making? So in terms of, um, of a single component fluid, the most advanced equation set we have is the compressible Euler equations. I won't show them here. Um, but we make a series of assumptions uh, to simplify this equation set for global models. 
We're actually in the process of undoing these assumptions now, but these are the ones that are used in, in, in uh, the finite volume and spectral element dynamical cores. So first of all, we make the spherical uh, geoid approximation with basically saying that gravity only acts radially. And that also means you're assuming that Earth is a sphere, which we know it's not, but close to being a sphere. Then we make what's called the quasi-hydrostatic assumption. That means we replace the vertical momentum equation with a diagnostic balance. And that's the balance shown here. It's rho is density, g is gravity, and we have the partial de derivative with respect to off pressure with respect to z. That's called the hydrostatic approximation. It's a pretty good approximation down to 10 kilometers and then it starts breaking down. That said, you know, Eastern WF is running at five kilometers and three kilometers with this approximation. Um, so there are people pushing it way beyond that limit. Then we also make what's called the shallow atmosphere assumption. That's a series of, uh, of assumptions. That means basically, um, if you think of the grid cells coming out of, of a sphere that would come out like this straight out. We basically assume that the area of each of the cells as you go up just have the same area. So they're basically a col column like this instead of columns like this that get much bigger as you go higher up. It's a good approximation for, for low top modeling, uh, but when we go to the geospace model, this is not a great approximation to make. Several die cores are moving away from these uh, approximations. So the MPAS model that we have does not have the, the hydrostatic assumption. It's a fully non-hydrostatic compressible Euler equation model. Um, and there is a lot of work by several groups, in, including here at NCAR, to get rid of this shallow atmosphere uh, approximation. But it, it makes a lot of things very complicated to get rid of that one. That's in terms of kind of the, the dynamics of the system. Uh, a very, very important component of our system is the thermodynamics of the system. So we don't just transport around or solve the equation of motion for dry air. We, we, we have to include water vapor and all the other forms of water in the system. So let's define what I mean when I say a moist uh, air power cell. So it has water vapor in it. That's a gaseous phase of, of, uh, of water as the most abundant form of water in the atmosphere. Then we have liquid water. It can exist in many forms. So we, we have them uh, as, as cloud liquid, for example. Um, then we have frozen forms of water. So different forms of, of, of ice. It can be in the form of rubble or snow or something like that. So everything on the items two and three here, they all condensate, they're not gases. So they have very different thermodynamic uh, properties. So associated with, with, with this um, is stepping back and asking what, what approximations are we making in the thermo and thermodynamics here? So first of all, we're assuming that the specific volume and condensate is zero. They don't occupy any, any air or any volume of the cell is a pretty good approximation. We're also really locking the atmosphere. The, the, for the most part, uh, air obeys the ideal gas law. So it means that pressure is related to density and, and temperature with this equation free here. Oceanographers do not have this um, privilege. Their equation of state is much more complicated. The specific heats are assuming constants. Um, and then we have two assumptions that I like to point out that one may not think about, but we actually make the assumption that everything has the same temperature. So that means that snow, rain, ice, and so on has the same temperature at the result scales. Is that a good assumption? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if you want to get rid of it, you can look up the paper by Bannon, but things get really complicated because then you need a thermodynamic equation for each of these species. We also make what's called a single velocity assumption. That also means that everything moves around with the same speed. Can be questionable at, at higher resolution. Um, I'm just talking about the die core here. When you go into physics, then of course, physics does move water around and so on. But on the result scales, everything moves with the same velocity. Typically, modeling groups um, make approximations to some thermodynamic uh, quantities. Take equation four here, where people simplify that equation somewhat 
Um, but one thing that can happen is you can actually violate basic uh, thermodynamic laws, such as the first and second law of, of thermodynamics when doing so. So there is a movement now in our community, like the cutting edge movement now is looking into using what's called thermodynamic potentials. Uh, and the cool thing about those, you know, oceanographers use these, is that you can derive all thermodynamic variables from there and you make sure everything is consistent. So you make all your assumption at the potential level. Another thing I don't get to talk too much about here, but I have a lot of interest in it and it's important for climate model that is that we are required to have a um, closed total energy budget in our system, both in the couple system, but also in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we don't have that and we run climate simulation, we can just get runaway effects in the system. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in that, we just submitted an article I'm really excited about. I'm sorry, it's 100 pages, but it's, it's written in a quite a pedagogical form, introduction to uh, introducing the concept of energy and energy budgets in, in the climate system. So if you're interested, um, have a look or talk to me. All right. So... We're making all of these assumptions. So all the dynamic assumptions I've just mentioned, all the thermodynamic assumptions that I just mentioned. If you apply those to the compressible Euler equation, assume a floating Lagrangian vertical coordinate. That means all our vertical terms disappear or they're implicitly taken care of elsewhere. Then the equations of motion look like this. So we have a continuous equation for, for air. We have a continuous equation for um, tracers. Again, the right-hand side here, these are on the floating Lagrangian coordinates. So this, this is the divergence term. So if you have uh, divergence, you know, this will reduce in size. If you have convergence, it will increase. Similarly for the tracers here. Uh, and then we have a, a momentum equation that I won't go too much into detail with. And then the finite volume core casts the thermodynamic equation in terms of potential temperature and the beauty of doing that is it takes exactly the same form as your continuity equation so you solve it with the same numerical method so the finite volume dynamical core solves this system using what's called an eulerian finite volume method just to give you an idea of what that's about that's illustrated on the next couple of slides here so what we do is we, we, we take the equation of motion, in this case, the con continuity equation for air. Finite volume means we integrate over a control volume, over a finite volume as shown up here, has an area D delta A, pressure level thickness dp. That means our continuity equation looks like this. Uh, and then we apply uh, Gauss's uh, divergence theorem to convert this area integral here into a surface integral. And the right-hand side of this equation here represents the instantaneous flux of mass in and out of this volume here. And then we also discretize uh, in time. So this was just in space. Now we discretize this guy on the left-hand side. And it basically says, you know, the new value of pressure level thickness minus the old one has to equal the time integral of these instantaneous fluxes over the time step. I always like to show things in a graphical way. This is the way I like to view things. Um, and again, I have done a lot of research on Lagrangian methods. So sorry, I'm biased towards Lagrangian methods. Um, but if you use a semi-Lagrangian method, you track areas that after one time step and ends up at your regular grid cell. So this gray area here will end up here after one time step. The continuous equations say mass over this area should equal mass over this area, and you're done. When you do an Eulerian flux form discretization of this, you can uh, visualize the fluxes like this. So this gray area here is exactly the same that I showed on the right-hand side here. And this yellow area here, after one time step, get pushed through this cell wall over here, in one time step. Similarly for this yellow area over here, and then the southern border, the northern border of the grid cell, and then you add up all of these uh, fluxes here. That's basically what we're trying to do. 
The final volume dynamic core is built on an advection scheme called the Lin root scheme. And I won't go too much into the detail here, but just think of it, these are uh, ways to approximate these yellow areas here, doing those integrals over time. Um, the Lin root scheme is a dimensionally split scheme, so it makes use of one dimensional operators. Um, if you're interested, there are some extra slides here showing the details of this that I won't go through, but you, you can ask me about them later if you want to. So I'll just flip through them here about those details. There we go. The continuous equation for uh, air, or not for air, for the traces. The next one here, you see it takes exactly the same form as, as this one, uh, as the one for, for air itself. Um, but the thing about that equation is it has different stability criteria. So this equation here, we have to solve with the momentum equation and the thermodynamic equation and has to obey the stability requirements for the fastest wave from the system. For hydrostatic system and a low top, our stability criteria is gravity waves that moves above 342 meters per second. So we're limited in time step for this equation by that. The continuity equation for tracers only depends on the fastest winds in your system. So if you have a relatively low top, that's not a, a, that's slower than 342 meters per second. So that means that this equation here, we can solve with a longer time step. And that's a really big deal in our system because we have lots of tracers. Our base model has 40-ish tracers. The chemist run with hundreds of tracers. So the computational cost of the die core is dominated by the continuity equation here for the tracers. So we take advantage of that in, in, in the system. And again, I've, uh, I used to go through the details of all of that. I don't have time for that. There, there I put those slides in, in, in the appendix because you have to be careful that you know don't violate important criteria. For example, you need to make sure that you preserve a constant, for example, meaning that if Q is one, this equation here has to numerically reduce to this equation here. So there's, there's stuff you need to consider when you run things on different time steps. The momentum equation, I won't go into the details, but to just think of it that we, we, we solve that equation with these gamma operators that at the end of the day, again, is a combination of these 1D operators that we use for advection as well. And as I mentioned, the thermodynamic equation, we're lucky, it looks like the continuity equation, so same numerical method there as well. So this equation set here uh, has no, at this point, no uh, explicit diffusion operators to control uh, our model at the grid scale. And the way this model is formulated, we have control over vorticity at the grid scale through implicit diffusion in our operators, uh, but we don't have control over divergence. And I'm gonna show that on this plot here. So this is a uh, total kinetic energy spectra. So that's what I showed on a schematic. The schematic on the right-hand side here is from the earlier slide. This shows data from an actual model simulation. And then let's focus on the red line here. So that's what we would get if we just solve the equations as they were on the previous slide. And you see that we have spurious accumulation of energy here at the grid scale. And if we separate that into the rotational and divergent parts of the spectra, you see that it's the divergent modes that are going haywire. So therefore we add a term called divergence damping term. Lots of models have this. If we do that, then we get the blue lines here and we see we tail off in, in, in um, quote unquote in a good way. Like we don't have spurious accumulation at the grid scale. So again, you can go in here and then you can estimate what, what the effective resolution to finite volume that I'm core, and you see it actually starts to deviate from this minus three curve quite early on or at quite large scales. All right, that's about it of what I would talk about for um, the finite volume dynamical core. It was developed about 20 years ago. And in that period of time, we've gone through a revolution in computing power. Um, 
we've been working very, very hard to take advantage of this computing power. Problem is the finite volume that I have a core does not lend itself well for massively parallel execution. The reason for that is um, we have this convergence of the meridian near the poles, the grid cells get smaller and smaller. And in order to stabilize the finite volume model, we need to apply what's called FFT filters along these latitude lines here. That does not lend itself very well for like two day, 2D domain decomposition of this domain here. And it's a similar story for spherical harmonics that used to be very, very popular. They've dominated for a very long time, but you have to do these Lagrange transforms that are very hard to scale out. That said, you know, when I was taking my PhD, people were talking about the eminent death of the spherical transform method. Here I am many years later, ESN WF is still using them. So it's, it's a very hard method to kill. So what we have done in, in, in a, as a community as a whole is we move to uh, more isotropic grids. That means that the grid cell sizes are more or less the same size. Um, and again, it's whether you like rice or pasta, I guess. Some people have really gone after the cube sphere grid. Some people really like the Voronoi grid. Uh, there are groups in Japan that are using this lat long grid where you, you take two lat long grids, chop up the poles, rotate one, glue them together like a baseball. Um, and what these grids do achieve for you is scalability. And, and this is a very old plot, but it gets the point through. Here's this, the spectral transform solution at a, at a quarter degree. This is throughput on the y-axis. So the higher up, the better. At the x-axis, the uh, number of resources we're throwing at the problem. And you see the spherical harmonics tail off really fast, meaning if you keep adding cores to this problem, you won't get any faster. The finite volume core here, the quarter degree, you start, it does really well in the beginning, and then there's not enough work to do. Our masses passing takes over um, the computational overall computational cost of the model. But then if we use a cube sphere model, like the, the spectral element model here, you see the thing just keeps scaling. So that means the more you throw at it in terms of computational resources, the faster you get your solution. However, do note that you know if you don't only have a small cluster available, you get way more throughput you know, with these other cores than the spectral element. Okay, I mentioned all these different cores here uh, before. Here's just some more details and, and references if, if you're interested. Uh, as I said, um, in CAM right now, all eyes or a lot of eyes are on the spectral element dynamic core, that's the next generation DICOR we have the most experienced uh, with. It was developed as a collaboration between DOE uh, and, and NCAR before I joined NCAR. Um, it has some nice properties. It's, it's mass conservative, uh, as are the other dynamical cores, but also has really good uh, energetics, conserves angular momentum really well. Important for super rotating planets. We don't know how important it is for, uh, for Earth. Uh, we've been using it for a long time for high resolution climate. Now we're trying to make it the one degree uh, default. And then as I alluded to earlier, we, we also have this option for a more accurate and faster transport scheme that we're, that we're using. The MPAS model uh, is developed here at NCAR in the m cubed lab. Uh, again, this was developed at the weather scale. Um, so it's like kind of a global version of WARF, if you're familiar with that one, but it's a fully non hydrostatic model. And, we have integrated into CAM right now, and, and, and there's a group uh, putting a lot of effort getting this to work well at really high resolution. So if you're going beyond, you say down to the three kilometers, you definitely you need to use a die core like this one. And then as I mentioned, we also have MPAS in here. Unfortunately, we didn't have funding to do the non-hydrostatic version, so we're only supporting the hydrostatic version of, of FP3 in our system. The really cool thing about these dynamical cores, which I haven't seen done with spherical harmonics um, or with lat long grids either, is that we can do mesh refinement. That means you can increase the horizontal resolution over your area of interest. Um, and with the CSM22, uh, we have functional support for free grids. That means they run out of the box. You don't need to make your own boundary data sets and whatnot. 
Here's the conus that uh, Gokhan mentioned. Here's the Arctic grid, 25 kilometers over the Arctic, and then here one that refines down to about 10 kilometers over uh, Greenland. Just a little word of warning, please don't use the 2.2 release with spectral elements. Uh, please use CAM development because we found several bugs in, in that release related to the numerics, um, all due to me actually. <laughs> Um, so please use newer code bases if you want to run this dynamical core. Just a little short success story of variable resolution. So um, I didn't mention this, but um, it's really, really hard to make or to have our physics parameterizations, at least some of them, to be well behaved across this scale. Uh, some of the parameterization were developed making assumptions, statistical assumptions, for example, with mass flux convection schemes, you, you want the updraft to only be a very small part of your, your grid cell. When we go down to really high resolution, some of these assumptions may start breaking down. And we go into what's called the gray zone. We are kind of resolving convection, but kind of not. Called the gray zone. And this will happen if you go down to high enough resolution. Also, we tune a lot of our parameterizations at one degree. and that tuning might not work well for high resolution. So in terms of variable resolution, I think the dynamical core problem has been solved. We have whale behaved solutions across scales. In terms of physics, that's where a lot of emphasis is right now. And that's a really, really challenging problem. That said, we actually have a success story with, with variable resolution. I'm sure there are many uh, other out here, but here's, my colleague Adam Harrington's result, who used, looked at the, um, the surface mass balance over Greenland with different configurations. Longer story short, when we go down to the higher resolution, 25 or 10K, these curves down here, we match this high resolution regional model over Greenland, whereas the one degree solutions are off by quite a bit. So it's a cool thing. We're resolving what needs to be resolved over Greenland to get this part of the problem right. If you wanna use uh, or make your own variable resolution grid, we put a lot of effort in to make this easier. Note easier, it's not easy. Um, doesn't really run out of the box, uh, but we can help you. Uh, there's a GitHub repository, repository sent up by uh, Patrick Callahan here at NCAR. Um, and this PDF here is basically a cookbook of how to set things up. And it has like this GUI here where you you manually show you know, what area do I want to refine. So this is an example of, of the Atlantic here. You want really high resolution here, low resolution here. Um, and then this software will then produce the grid for you. And the challenge here is to make grids that are smooth enough um, so that you don't get instabilities across the refinement um, regions. So look at that website if you're interested in making your own grids. And remember you have to also then make uh, other data that goes into the model needs to be mapped to this grid and so on. But there's a lot of work on making this a lot easier. I just wanna make the point that, you know, you won't be up and running in one day, It'll take a little longer. Am I towards the end? Yeah, good. Um, if you're interested in numerical methods, um, there's a really good book by Dale Duran that's used by a, a lot of universities. So it, it talks about, finite difference methods, spectral methods, Galerkin methods, et cetera, et cetera. That's the one I used when, when I went to, when I went to uh, grad school. Um, however, it, it doesn't really go into some of the complexities we have with, 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 with um, global models. Um, so I have another book, apologies for the self-promotion. I don't get any money out of this. <laughs> Uh, but we had a, a colloquium here back in, in 2006 uh, where all the lectures were written, written up as, as chapters. And that book goes more into a lot of the details of, of what goes into designing a global model from a numerical methods uh, point of view. Um, some parts of the book are a little updated, but I think it's a pretty good place to start if you're interested in that. With that, I'll take questions.
sorry, can we use the mic if you want to ask a question? Just, yep. Um, I had a question about the non hydrostatic dynamical cores that you showed. So at that point, when you're resolving the compression of like the air, or water, whatever fluid, and now you're having sound and acoustic waves, does that sort of impose a barrier of the time step that you have to like make them so small now because you have to resolve these very fast waves? Yeah. Um, so in the case of the MPAS dynamical core, most people use an implicit solver in the vertical. So implicit means you can you can run longer time steps uh, in the vertical than with explicit um, representation. And then the, in the horizontal, there, there's sub-stepping solving for the, the faster terms in the equation of motion. So the dynamical core is like a hierarchy of time step, but over the acoustic modes, you take very short time steps to make sure that the model is stable. Okay. And so, and sort of going on that, when you have the variable grid sort of like tighter inside of these larger ones, does that sort of change some of your assumptions you have to make for the entire thing? Because... Yeah, that's that's a really good point that, that I didn't mention. Um, the way we currently run these variable resolution model is we, we run them as if we had the high resolution everywhere. So that means okay. we set the time step to whatever is stable in the high resolution area. But that means you run the low resolution area with very, very small time steps. Sure. Uh, but if you look at it from a computational cost point of view, unless your refinement area is super, super small, it's still like 90% of the computational cost is in the high res area. So you get the global solution basically for free. Um, but the tough thing that we're, um, to put some work into is that we also run physics at a time step where we, we would run it at as if we're running at the highest resolution everywhere. And that means we are running physics in the low resolution area at that time step. And our solution does not look quite the same as if we ran the long physics time step. So, so a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting problems to, to look at in, in that regard. Thank you. Welcome, good question. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. That was, that was excellent, I guess, introduction and um, understanding of the framework in which the, the atmospheric dynamics are working. Um, you know, looking looking at uh, fluid mechanics and, and thermodynamics and understanding the perspective. Uh, after the break, we're going to be going into what's called the physics of the model, looking at convection and other components by Rich Neal. Uh, it's now um, I'm going to say 15 minutes break. So what we'll do is uh, come back at 20. I think it's 10 at uh, 10:40. Uh, so get out, get some more coffee, some go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do. But we'll be back in here at 10.40 for Rich's talk. So thank you. <laughs>